going to go ahead and record so that way everyone will be able to have it. And again, we're going to be live on the Center for the Ministry of Teaching page. Um, so that means that we will also be taking chats and questions from there um, so that uh, we can um, get some other participation from there as well. So we're ready to go. Um, so welcome to the eFormation webinar for April, um, Hybrid Faith Formation. Um, I am joined by my friends and colleagues, Dave Smith Pritchard and Steve Thomason. I will introduce them um, both in a second. But we're going to go ahead and start with um, a brief scripture passage and prayer to center us in um, as before we talk about our faith formation um, explorations. Steve, would you be able to read this passage for us? Yes. This passage is from Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 21. Place these words on your hearts. Get them deep inside you. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Teach them to your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning until you fall into bed at night. Inscribe them on the doorposts and gates of your cities so that you will live a long time and your children with you on the soil that God promised to give your ancestors for as long as there is a sky over the earth. Is there more? No, that's it. Okay. There's a short one today. All right. And Day, will you um, pray for us or be our one voice? I will be happy to. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, Enlighten by your Holy Spirit all those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship you and serve you from generation to generation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dan. Welcome. So my name is Sarah Stonecipher, and I work as the digital missioner for the Center for the Ministry of Teaching at Virginia Theological Seminary. Um, so I'm based out of VTS, which is located in Alexandria, Virginia, and I am also the eFormation convener. And so we um, so we gather uh, those interested in learning about digital media from ministry, and um, and as they bring it back to their parishes and to their organizations. So this is um, sort of an outpouring of of uh, of, of interest um, based around hybrid faith formation. Um, and my, uh, my predecessor, Kyle Oliver, was one who worked with Day and others in order to make sure that this was sort of on educators' minds. Um, you know, at educators, Christian formation people, Christian educators, whatever title you want to give yourself. Um, church super volunteers are sometimes the most applicable <laughs> title. Um, but I am joined by my, again, my friends and colleagues, Dave Smith Pritchard and Steve Thomason. Um, so Day um, is right now the executive director of Episcopal Evangelism Society, which is a wonderful organization that focuses on um, how we can get our Episcopal message out into the world. Um, and before that, she was a longtime uh, faith formation professional working at I think a few different parishes within the di within um, Diocese of Virginia and the Diocese of Washington. And she is now located in uh, Durham, North Carolina. So thank you so much for joining me today, Day. You're welcome. Um, and then my, my new friend and colleague, Steve Thomason, um, is hailing from Minnesota. Um, so hopefully all of those Lutherans out there are um, joining in just for him. <laughs> <laughs> So um, Steve was able to join us at the eFormation flagship gathering in January, um, where he did our visual sketch notes. And you will see um, his strength and creativity come through um, when, he shares, uh, when he shares his approach to hybrid faith formation. And so Steve is the, and I'm forgetting your title now, the director of family, no, minister for family. Past, pastor of family faith. All right, I was, I was getting there. I was getting there um, <laughs> at, East, at Easter Lutheran Church. Um, yes. And as, as one, of our, uh, one of my colleagues said, um, I would pay to have an email address with uh, easter.org as the end. So 
we're all incredibly jealous. Um, and Steve actually has a previous life um, as an illustrator and animator. Um, and again, you will see all of his uh, wonder and glory soon. <laughs> Um, so a quick introduction to Zoom, if that's how you are joining us. Um, many of you have been taking advantage of the chat box, and so that's how you'll be able to ask questions and add in your comments. Um, and we will be having two questions and answer points, um, one in the middle and then one at the end. So don't worry, your questions will not get lost amidst all of that. Um, and then if you're joining us on Facebook, you of course can comment and I will grab those for the questions and answers as well. Again, all of the video and the slides will be made available and sent out um, if you registered uh, to your email on Friday. So I promise it will be arriving to your inbox. All right. Are you ready to tackle hybrid faith formation? Mm -hmm. Oops, I was pressing the wrong button. So um, the way that we approach our, our faith formation understanding at the Center for the Ministry of Teaching, we're really guided by the Maria Harris Five Curricula Principles and Fashion Me a People. And throughout all of this, our formation tries to touch on um, these uh, five uh, Greek words that are all integrated into our, into our church community as well as to our formation community. And so these mean that throughout all of these, we're attempting to create um, a community so that we can investigate and uh, understand what prayer and spirituality look like so that we can teach. And then this is where the evangelism part comes in, where we can go and proclaim so that we can be a loving service and understanding to our world. And so this is, these are sort of the five sections that we look at. And of course, there's a fair amount of overlap in all of these, but these of course are all of the ways that we learn about ourselves and learn about our faith. And so as we look at hybrid education, so my background is as a school librarian and I worked in schools for six years. Um, so this idea of hybrid education, um, and so we have a, a few different words that we're gonna go through. We have hybrid education that provides online and in-person experiences for learning. And so Dave and Steve have, have both of these examples within, um, within their own parish experience. And then what does hybrid faith formation look like? So it's creating that space online and it's creating that space in person so that you know, we can have that spiritually shaping experience for teaching, discussion, proclamation, and creating community. And so you'll notice that the online is also essential as part of the creating community space and that follow up. Um, so another term that educators like to uh, like to mention a lot is the flipped classroom. And I believe that this can also be applied within um, within the Sunday school or adult education forum as well of where content is viewed at home. Um, and then the teacher comes in and then they they problem solve together. So it goes immediately down to the discussion pieces. So again, so bringing bringing the information, the meaty information to the people before they arrive and then having those discussions in person, which is how we build community and connection. Again, going back to Maria Harris. So the blended learning um, is sort of the, the, the establishment and understanding that we can do online and in person together. Um, and so what I love about blended learning is that it really emphasizes the independence um, and the, the real um, in investment in the student end. And, and you can sub student for, um, for parishioner or you know, person in the pew or family together. So that way they are investigating um, and really coming to understand what the best pieces are for their spiritual experience. So again, that personalization is really essential. So I flew through that. Um, that was a lot of educational theory in a, lot, in a short amount of time. I know I'm a fast talker. Um, do, we have any, do we have any questions about sort of this background before we dive into Day and Steve's work? So sometimes there is a little bit of a lag, um, but uh, so we will, I will patiently wait and look at both of our, uh, both of our sources here. 
And so I think a lot of what's nice about this hybrid faith formation, and I don't think that it was happening as uh, much as it currently is, um, is that so many schools and um, other educational institutions are taking advantage of it. And so this is another example of, um, of, the, of the parishes sort of modeling what is happening. All right, not seeing any questions right now. Um, so we'll go ahead and forge on. And then remember, you can always ask questions at any time via the chat box and we will come back to it. All right, Day, you're up with St. Andrews in Arlington. Hi, everybody. Sarah mentioned that I had um, a fairly lengthy career as a formation professional. And I think it's important to say that I had started at a large um, in the Episcopal Church, we call it a corporate-sized parish in Washington, D.C., that had a very traditional Christian formation program, a, uh, a graded Sunday school, three different age groups of youth group. Uh, we used the published curricula that we're all familiar with, and, um, uh, and that was a great place to start. And we experienced a lot of success in uh, forming those children and youth uh, in Christianity. We had a large confirmation class every year. Um, and it was all good, but if there's anything that I regretted about that experience, it was the isolation of ministry with, with just children or with just youth or with just a specific age group. And what I really longed to implement was the kind of learning environment where parents and children experienced faith formation together. So when I went to St. Andrews Arlington, I finally had the opportunity to play around with that. And Sarah, you can move us to the next slide. Um, the situation at St. Andrews is that it was a fairly small parish um, that had been through a lot that was, in, that was in transition. And we found ourselves wanting to interpret the changing attitudes towards Christian formation and to respond to them with innovation. So the changes in attitudes that we experienced were, um, first of all, that people weren't necessarily looking for an Episcopal church when they came to St. Andrews. They were just looking for a place where they felt welcome, a place where they felt at home, where they felt like their, their faith could, could grow and flourish with their families. Um, families were a above average regular in their participation in worship. Um, they came to church together most Sundays, but um, uh, they just didn't care about Sunday school. It wasn't in the mindset of what they were looking for when they came to church. Um, and, uh, and they didn't necessarily want to um, be at church for that long on a Sunday morning to do worship and Christian formation. Um, so they were committed to worship, they were not committed to Sunday school. Um, also as a parish in transition, we found ourselves with um, very few prospective teachers um, to choose from. I like to say that uh, that, that well was dry. Um, we just didn't have, didn't have a lot of, a lot of um, capital there to, to draw on to nurture a healthy Sunday school program. Um, I mentioned that I was in Arlington, Virginia, adjacent to Alexandria, where the Center for the Ministry of Teaching is located. I'm an alumna of the uh, Christian Formation Degree Program at Virginia Seminary, and I had stayed in close contact with Kyle Oliver and uh, with Lisa Kimball and um, had been talking to them and talking about the issues that were facing us at St. Andrews, and they sort of dared me to try something really different and promised to support me through that process. And uh, so in conversation with them, in conversation with our rector, and in conversation with some of the more active families at St. Andrews, 
we literally shut down our Sunday school and launched the St. Andrew's FISH program. And uh, FISH stands for Families Integrating Sunday at and Home. Um, and Sarah, let's go to the next slide. Our goal there, our overpowering goal, our overarching goal was to empower parents to be the formation leaders in their families at home and to give them what they needed to be able to speak with confidence as formation leaders. So really, it, um, if you think about those slides that Sarah introduced in the beginning of our time together, we were integrating the uh, principles of hybrid faith formation as well as flipped faith formation and blended faith formation, all three. Um, if that sounds like a lot, uh, let me break that down for you. And um, the backbone of our program, hands down, was our family worship. Parents had told us that they wanted to worship together with their children. They wanted to sit on the floor. They wanted to roll around and hug and whisper throughout worship. So we had an alternative service of the word, which we call the family service. And I led that service every week. Um, and what it was, was a, um, a, as I said, it was multi-generational parents and their families working together. Um, we were able to integrate worship and teaching in a way that I didn't think was possible before. Um, but we just kind of took some risks and tried stuff and, um, uh, and it worked, so we, we kept doing what worked and we stopped doing what didn't work. Um, and I'll tell, more about the, I'll tell more about the family service um, in just a minute. But um, when we shut down the Sunday school, the family service was, was my lifeline to stay connected with the families and to hear about what they were doing at home, uh, to hear what they were praying for, um, you know, continuing to worship with them, the family service was what kept us connected. We also developed a website, which I threw together on Weebly.com. There are much better ways to do that, but Weebly was what I had access to at the time and it worked out just fine. So um, on our Weebly site, we developed uh, weekly ref reflections based on the gospel from the previous Sunday. Uh, prayer starters that families could use at home over the dinner table or whenever they gathered. I remember one family whose regular family time was at the, at the breakfast table. Uh, that was what they did. Um, and then discussion starters and activities that families could do at home. And I updated that weekly. Um, and, then, and then we held multi-generational formation events about every four to six weeks. So instead of Sunday school every Sunday, we had a formation event about every four to six weeks. And we, that was, um, sometimes it was seasonal, sometimes it was based on a scriptural theme that we um, um, had pulled out in worship. Uh, sometimes they were service oriented, but in those events we tried to uh, we tried to nurture everybody. So we tried to open with a theme or an activity that would engage families all together. And we would typically split and have the adults do one thing and the children do another thing. And then we would come back together and reflect on what we had learned together. Um, Sarah, if you want to flip. Yes, you did already. Thank you. Um, a lot of that was drawn from John Roberto's Reimagined Faith Formation, and that is um, something you're all probably very familiar with, but, but that is a link that you'll have access to when you, when you get the slides. And Roberto spends a lot of time reflecting on intergenerational faith formation, how we can learn from each other when we're all together, and the, the beauty and the mystery and the wonder of that. Um, and, and he similarly, he explores family faith formation. So the model that we used with the um, with our every four to six week formation gatherings came straight from Roberto and he outlines how to do that, starting with everyone all together, splitting up by ages, bringing people back together and 
coordinating the kind of situation where people can truly, truly learn from each other. And then remember still that the backbone of this was our weekly family worship. And that drew from many curricula. It had elements of godly play. It had elements of, um, of the more um, didactic curricula that you're all familiar with. We played around with how to teach about worship. This is how we pray. This is what it means when we come together. This is what it means when we go forth. Um, teach about sacraments. When we go into communion, here's what we'll be doing. Here's what we'll be experiencing. Um, and obviously teaching about scripture during the story time. Uh, so we tried to strike a balance between teaching about these things while doing them. Um, Sarah, if we can go to the next slide. Um, how did it work? Um, we had a really strong, enthusiastic response for at least a year, probably closer to two years. When we looked really closely, we found that the same families who were enthusiastic about Sunday school were enthusiastic about fish. And we could tell from their engagement that they were following along um, with the weekly exercise and saying their prayers at home, reflecting on the gospel of the day at home. And not surprisingly, some of the other families, well, not so much. Um, isn't that the way it goes? Uh, isn't that the way it goes in Christian formation? Uh, we continued it for, um, I think, probably three years. Um, and um, had series, you know, had periodic ex assessments of um, talking to people, asking what they liked, asking what they didn't like, you know, making revisions. Um, and for myself and for the rector, um, uh, it was just time for us to move on. And um, our priorities changed. I got a new call, the rector got a new call. And um, so neither of us is, is still at St. Andrews. Sarah Stone Cipher, um, Sarah, let's go to the next slide. Sarah found this online somewhere, and I think that it is an accurate representation of what they're doing now. They are no longer maintaining the website, um, but they are um, putting in the weekly announcements. They're putting in opportunities to reflect on what was talked about the Sunday before a family prayer starter and looking ahead, um, looking ahead to the next, um, the next week's activities. Um, I think in retrospect, I think the most valuable things that I learned from coordinating a program like that, um, in terms of my own leadership, I felt like I was free to concentrate and focus on what was really important, um, focusing much less on sort of the day-to-day nitty-gritty of administering a Sunday school program. And uh, I think most of you know what that's like. Um, more importantly, I think the families that were literally carrying Sunday school on their backs, the parents who were the teachers, the ones who were coming every Sunday, uh, my favorite thing about FISH was watching those families explore their interest in other ministries, um, taking on outreach ministries, taking on other formation ministries, um, becoming leaders in liturgical ministries, um, helping them to um, explore the other areas of Maria Harris's uh, koinonia and uh, find their strengths in each of those when formation was built into all the other things that we were doing. Um, I think that's what Maria Harris had in mind, and that was certainly my favorite part of, of doing FISH. Um, would I do it again? Absolutely. Um, it was a wonderful experience, and um, I commend you to discern with your leadership how much of a risk you're willing to take, able to take, given the setting where you are, uh, take those risks and uh, try something new and different. Um, and Dave, we have one quick question. Yes. The location of your family service um, uh, within the sanctuary or was it a separate place? We were fortunate enough to have a beautiful chapel that was adjacent to the sanctuary. And so the family service was an alternative service of the word. Um, so uh, we did all the same stuff that was happening in 
the primary worship service. We, we processed, we sang, we heard scripture, we reflected on scripture, we prayed, we responded to scripture. Um, and it was in a separate place that looked very much like a worship space. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I, I see a few questions that are coming in and we will um, get to them right after Steve's presentation, which I'm sure will um, sort of spark even more questions. All right, Steve. Hey, so what's our time frame? About, do I have like five minutes or? Well, you have, you have as much as you want to take. Oh, okay. But, yeah, about 10 minutes. So that way we can get in some good questions and answers. Excellent. Because I know you guys will have all of the answers for all of their questions. So oh, worry. yeah, right. So, Sarah, do I have the ability to run these slides or do I have to tell you to run them? You can do it, but you can also share your screen if you want to. Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. And uh, I've got my little logo up there because... Um, my tagline through life has been following the cloud. And the reason I say that is because I've, God has led me uh, across a very, a lot of theological landscapes. I started off as a very fundamentalist Baptist as a child, uh, went up through the emerging or through the evangelical megachurch, Willow Creek style church for a while and did some emerging church house church work. And uh, now I'm in the ELCA. So it's been a, a wild journey, and um, I, I want to talk to you about uh, some experiments that I did at my last call. So my first experience at a Lutheran church was in Andover, Minnesota, and I was there from 2010 to just to last year. So I, and I'm, I've been in a new column coming up on one year here at Easter. So everything I'm going to tell you are things that I experimented with at grace in Andover that I'm hoping to try to weave into my time here at Easter. Um, but, you know, a new call takes a while to try things. But I got to experiment. So uh, rather than, can you go to my next slide? Um, yeah. So rather than um, do my slides, I'm actually going to share my screen with you so that you don't have to look at me. You can look at my website. Uh, so here we go. We're going to go to Google Chrome, share screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we got okay. it. So my website, stevethomason.net. Um, I blog, I've been, I've been working, I, I'm showing you this website for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, because I use WordPress and I have been using WordPress for a really long time. I've been blogging since about 2002 and uh, made lots of mistakes and have crashed my site and rebuilt it several times. Uh, this particular site has been going since 2012. And um, you can see the date here. This is something that I wrote in December of 2015 after a particular experiment. And here's what I was trying to do. Um, I wanted to create more access. So there's, there's like a mantra in digital media and flipping the script is that you want to, it's good to have one curriculum, but multiple delivery methods. And actually I learned that mantra from Saddleback back in the early nineties of have one curriculum, multiple delivery methods. They just didn't have digital back then. So it's just a really good philosophy. And so uh, I experimented with uh, a, an adult learning class where I was, I just, it, it can, the, the topic can be anything, but this particular class was, I was doing a course on um, the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. And so what I did was we had a, a Sunday evening adult learning space where people would gather together. We would have a community meal together, and then we would break out into elective classes. And I taught this class, and it was in our fellowship hall. And I got a guy who was really comfortable with video, videography, who did an excellent job of video recording the teaching sessions. And so I would teach a live classroom while it was being video recorded. And you can see that right here. So session one was video recorded. And then I was committed to editing that video, splicing my PowerPoints and my videos together. 
and putting it online. And I use a platform that is uh, designed, it's called Sensei, and it's designed by a company called Woo. And maybe you've heard of WooCommerce. Well, Wu cre has created a plugin for WordPress that takes a learning management system and embeds it. It's kind of, you know, kind of like Moodle and all, Blackboard. And th there's all these learning management systems that are out there. But Sensei is designed to integrate completely with your WordPress site. And so I created a, a learn, I called it Grace Learning Center for the church. And so I had uh, these courses online. And so by by Tuesday morning of the of that week, I would have the video online with all of the resources and links from the course. And then on Wednesday night, I would teach the same course live. Uh, so I had basically two live sessions and then an online session with the video. And what happened through this uh, experience was we had, a, we had four different uh, levels of engagement. Some people would just come to the live session on Sunday, and that was enough. Other people would come to the live session on Wednesday, and that was enough. Other people did it completely online. And so I had people from all around the world, actually, who would, were taking the course online with us. And then the fourth way of engagement was people who were in either of the live sessions felt like if they missed a week, they could just go online and watch the video. So uh, it, was, it was a really fun experiment. This particular blog, uh, there's a little screenshot of what the video looked like. This particular blog post is me reflecting on the experience and talking about what worked, what didn't work, that, those kinds of things. I, I went on then in the spring and did it again and hopefully did it a little bit better and the result of that, and, and here's uh, comments that people gave on their experience of it. I want to go to another page and show you um, what happened with these videos. Uh, the next, in the spring, I did this course called OMG, Can We Talk About God? And it's basically an introduction to theology. It was just a course that was loosely using David Lose's book, uh, Making Sense of the Christian Faith. Um, but I took all of those videos and then broke them down into little bite-sized chunks and created a playlist on YouTube where people could uh, do the session online, okay? I wish I could show you the Grace Learning Center website, but I can't because here's one of the things that I've learned is I was the only person on staff who knew how to do this technology and I'm not there anymore. So, so every, everyone is, is saying yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so we dismantled that website because I knew that it would lay fallow and it would get infected with hackers. So we just kind of totally broke it down, but I'm rebuilding a new one called uh, the journey and it's the dash faith dash journey.com. And so uh, I just want to show you what it looks like right now. I'm in the process of, uh, creating a confirmation, a hybrid confirmation program at our current church where uh, families will have an option to either do all, you know, residential, like come out every Wednesday night and do the traditional confirmation process, or this, this congregation, I inherited a wonderful system where they already had an option where you could just spend a week at Camp Wapagasset Camp Wapo in Wisconsin and get the bulk of your teaching at camp and then just do a monthly small group activity all year. But this year I'm proposing to add a third hybrid option where you could do basically an independent uh, form your own small group and work through the curriculum at your, in your own time and space, um, but still have all the benchmarks of what you need to learn, the growth and service hours, things you need to do, totally flipping the classroom. Uh, but this, just let me show you what it looks like. Um, this is what Sensei looks like. Uh, this is the overview of the, uh, the catechism year. And then if you drill down into one particular lesson, I mean, it looks a lot like um, any other kind of learning management 
system. I, I was just about to comment. Um, so in, in learning management systems are the ways that courses are organized um, so that you can step through it as if it were sort of a binder of material and you can also submit assignments. So it's exactly. what high schools, middle schools, high schools, universities use um, to sort of organize their classes and sort of be the online presence for the class. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, so this would be the lesson, the Big Ten, love God. So this is the the first three of the Ten Commandments. So they would watch this video, um, which is just me actually in the same setup, directly addressing the camera, but also having my PowerPoints and stuff inside. So there, there you can see that's what the video looks like. But then at the end of each lesson, they would take a quiz and uh, it would track them through the curriculum. And over here on the right, you can see that it tracks through each module. And as you complete a lesson, it checks it off. Mm -hmm. and I, if you, if I'll show you the back end. I, as the director of the the online course, I can come over here to Sensei and uh, get an analysis of who's taking courses, what they've done. Uh, I can go to the course. Th this isn't launched yet, so there's not a lot of people. I, I have a few people that are taking the Axe course online as an experiment, but you can see. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful program. So those, those are some of the things that I've ex been experimenting with. So I, I wanted to highlight just more of the technology of the integration of uh, creating a WordPress site using Wu Sensei, because it's all integrated within the one website. Now, of course, you have to know how to use WordPress and Sensei. There's a learning curve in that. Um, but those are some of the things that I have done. I, I've also used that same model uh, for our ninth grade confirmation students at Grace, uh, we had a ninth grade curriculum, which was again a video driven curriculum where I created videos, uh, put them online, and then uh, they had a one on one mentor. And so the, the student and the mentor could access all of the curriculum in their own time and space, do the curriculum, and then they could interact with each other. Uh, another thing about um, Sensei is that if you if you use um, WordPress, you can get a free plugin called BuddyPress, and you can turn Sensei into a social network site as well. So within the groups, within the courses, you can actually create small groups. So people can, um, they can talk to each other. So if I come over here to my Axe course, uh, people can, you can see over here it says who's taking the course and these are people's profiles so it's kind of like having a facebook within your online school um so i mean this is not anything new this is just like sarah said every school in the world is doing stuff like this but i think that uh it's it's got great potential for local congregations to mm -hmm. be able to integrate um real space but for me the 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 beauty of digital media is that people can access the curriculum in their own time and space and on their mobile devices, sitting in a coffee shop, whatever. But then there's still a small group that they can meet with whenever they want. Um, so that, that's as much as I probably should share at this point. So. Steve, thank you. We are getting all sorts of comments of asking, of sharing Eli Pearson, who is another Master's um, of Arts in Christian Education um, uh, alum from BTS, is asking if, uh, if, uh, if you can clone herself, uh, clone yourself to come to her congregation. There you, you go. You are wanted in the <laughs> in New England. Job, job security, right? If I don't work out here at Easter, right? Exactly, exactly. So don't worry, don't okay. worry. Um, so we have a few different questions um, coming up, and I'm just going to reshare my screen um, in case they uh, in case they come up. Um, and so let me just click through here. Um, so we were so a few people were wondering about particular learning management systems that I've worked well with churches. I did include a link um, that includes some free ones. And I know um, I, Steve, you had mentioned um, Moodle, which is a very it's a very another similar um, course structure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, that would be one that I would recommend as well. Um, and then, uh, so then somebody else asked, 
Um, if you are using curriculum to base your sort of your structure off of? Yes, I, I am, uh, for the confirmation stuff, I'm loosely using the Here We Stand uh, curriculum. So I recommend that our students buy the Here We Stand um, student book, which is, that's published by Augsburg Fortress. So that's a, it's been around a long time. Uh, I actually really like the Here We Stand student book. It's a nice balance of good solid information and a little bit of silliness, but it's not like too wacky. Um, it's just a good, it's, it's kind of like a textbook. So I reference that book in the lessons, but mm -hmm. I'm making up my own curriculum as far as the videos and my PowerPoints. Because I am a cartoonist, I do a lot of my own illustration. And so I know I have kind of a unique space in the world where I can actually, if I have an idea, I can actually draw it myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm creating my own visual curriculum and the handouts and everything um, myself because the here we stand, there isn't a curriculum that fits uh, any church's particular calendar. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've created a schedule of the topics and then I just kind of glean from here we stand for some, for, uh, for the small group activities for the small group leaders and things like that. Um, and then we have another question about um, the uh, copyright issues with posting curriculum. Steve, do you want to address that or do you want me to t take a first stab and then you can do it? I can just tell you what I think. Yeah, absolutely. Is I, I don't post anything from here we stand on my website. Mm -hmm. I reference the page numbers and, and tell them to, to buy the textbook. Um, but I don't directly use any here we stand curriculum on the site itself because okay. I haven't I, I purchased a license for my congregation um, so that I, I can I can freely download their curriculum and I but I don't have a license to publish it on my website Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you're just, so you're just sort of using it, um, the, the Here I Stand curriculum as, as a reference, not copying and pasting um, right. your entire thing. And um, my, my librarian hat would come on and say, um, if you purchase a license at a, as a parish, um, then you would, and part of the advantage to what Steve was doing is Steve is doing, and really, um, the, the, if, if they had sent it out via emails, is that it would just be going to a certain number of people. It would not be made available to the entire public. So that, that provides um, some security. So it would be the same thing as, you know, if you were going to get up there and read um, the entire curriculum of, you know, Jennifer Gamber's book um, out loud, that you would be sharing that information um, but you know, it would only be for those people in the room. So again, so you're having the same only in people for those people in the room experience for that, that online platform. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then, um, David Stout would like to know what is the learning curve for this approach? So did you, did you have to work a lot on the structure before you launched it or were you, or, and then tweak it a lot? Well, I'm a dabbler, so I have been dabbling in WordPress and Sensei for a while. Mm -hmm. and so I, I am, I'm a good person to have as a panelist and a bad person to have as a panelist because I, I geek out over this stuff. I don't know if I have like a boilerplate here, just plug this in and it's going to work in three days. Um, it, I don't know of anything that works like that. Mm -hmm. um, you really need to have some knowledge of WordPress and how these things work if you want to do it yourself, which is why I know that I think, Day, you used uh, Weebly or uh, those are yes. much more intuitive. Right. But you don't have as much control over them. Exactly. Um, exactly. But I think, I mean, I think the what you're saying, Steve, really highlights what formation professionals know and and practice on a regular basis that that anything you do has to be yours um it has to come from from your knowledge and your expertise and and most importantly from your heart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so 
Oh, here we go. Um, I, thank you, Sharon, for chiming in. So Sharon is an editor at Church Publishing Group, and she says, um, if your church has a license to use particular curricula, you should share and post on a private password protected area that only your congregations have access to. Right. Um, and so again, so same idea is that it is for people who are in the room. So it's, it couldn't be found via Google. And just for the record, um, these sites are that. So they're mm -hmm. the only people who are seeing these lessons are registered students of confirmation program. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, uh, we have a few other questions, a few other sort of tech heavy questions. Um, are there any uh, tools that you all would recommend, um, either hardware or software, for the creation of resources? Are you asking day either, and- Either, yeah. it, was, it was an answer to the room, a question to the room. Well, I'll, I'll, I will say that this device right here is, is my favorite thing in the world. The people on it are, but the device <laughs> is an iPad Pro 12.9 12, 12 with the Apple Pencil. I do like 95% of everything, including my professional illustration work on this device. And because you can do screen recording. Um, I'm, I'm working on a presentation right now where I'm gonna be giving, a, uh, I'm proposing a new thing to our confirmation families and I'm going to be recording the whole thing uh, as a screen recording on my iPad while I'm walking them through this new concept. Mm -hmm. Then I'm gonna post that video on our website and, and ask people to watch it and then take a survey rather before we get together for the meeting. So I wanna to try to get as many people to watch this. So that's another example of using digital media is you, so on this device, I can do all of that on that device, post it to our website, get as much feedback from people and then have this uh, real time meeting so that they don't get the information cold. Um, so that was more than the question asked, but <laughs> iPad Pro. Dave, do you have any recommendations? Uh, just I'm a big fan of the of the intuitive easy to use stuff and mm -hmm. I would just put in a plug for canva.com for uh, creating mm -hmm. graphics. Um, I just I have a mental block when I can't find the image I want and Canva okay. helps you create it. Um, I also, would oh yeah. Yeah well also Canva uh, there's another Adobe has a new product called Spark. And you don't have to be an Adobe customer. I mean, you can use it for free, yeah. but if you are an Adobe Creative Cloud customer, it's even richer. But Spark, you can do Spark Post, Spark Video, uh, Spark Page. It, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I know there was a question about like sort of handouts. Um, and um, what I love about um, PCs and Macs now, I, I actually am living in dual worlds as I turn my head, um, of that a lot of programs are already embedded within the free software that comes to it. So um, for when I um, record, a lot of it is done on um, photo booth on my Mac. Um, when I do screencasts, when I, um, as, as Steve was talking about for his iPad, um, taking a video of him moving around his screen, um, so that's what a screencast is, like I use preview on my Mac. Um, and again, I know that there are similar um, options available on the PC. And another one that teachers rely on really heavily is Screencast-O-Matic. Um, so that way uh, they, can, they can download it really quickly um, and make it available for free. I found a, a new a fun hack where on QuickTime, uh -huh. you, can, you can do a screen, you can do a video recording and have it inset and then do a screen capture at the same time. Yeah. So I have my talking head while they're watching my video, while they're watching my screen. So I have my PowerPoint and my talking head next to each other, screen capture that, and then you can take that in and that's what you upload. That's um, just quick time. I had this vision of Bob Ross, um, of course, happy trees, happy and trees. Yeah. And painting, but then you'll like zoom in on the painting. Yeah. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, so we have another technical question and then we'll get into a philosophical 
one. Um, Malcolm wants to know what programs you use on your iPad Pro. Steve, you, oh. you, you use a lot. I've seen you use at least two different drawing tools. Um, I use for note taking and, and for more simple graphic presentations, I use Note Shelf. Um, but the, ba the best artist program out there is Procreate for the iPad. And, um, and I have for years, so ever since 2002, I went completely digital in my illustration studio and I was using uh, Corel Painter. I still use Corel Painter on my desktop with a Wacom uh, tablet, but in the iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil and Procreate is 95% of what I can do on my desktop. It is so good. Mm -hmm. Um, awesome. And I use Procreate as well, um, because I, uh, practice like hand lettering. And so that's what I, that's what I use with, mm -hmm. um, with a, with a pencil. And so that's my, that's my yep. way around that, that navigation as well. Um, so we have a, a more philosophical question, um, of what do you, uh, and this is from Larry Ahrens, um, who works a lot with the catechumenate. How do you link this kind of hybrid model to communal worship and rights? I think Day's, Day was more in tune with that. Mm -hmm. I would say you don't link it. You never let it get separated in the first place. Um, um, you know, there's, there's no substitute for relationship. Mm -hmm. um, ours was always intended to be an offshoot of our um of our community gathering and it was um intended to um wasn't intended to replace any kind of relationship it was just intended to um empower parents and, and give them the tools and the the language um and the opportunity they needed to step into a new role as as formation leaders uh formation leaders in their families um, on a practical on a practical side, um, you know, just walking through leading the family service on a week to week basis, um, um, you know, in, instead of a collect, I had this uh, godly play circle of the church here up on the wall, and I'd say, here we are on the third Sunday of Easter, the season where we continue to celebrate uh, Jesus' resurrection. And on the fish site, there's a really cool picture of so and so. So be sure you see that as well. Um, so I would just, I was, I would always refer to the fish site. I would say, you know, this week when you say your prayers, uh, there's a suggestion on the fish site for how you might use a little basket to whatever, you know, I don't, I don't remember. It's been a while, but um, just verbally, I would, I would always try to link and, and, and be aware that it was never intended to replace um, relationship or any of the things that, that are, are the true means for faith formation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it was intended to enhance relationship and to let parents join into that relationship in a way that they, that they weren't otherwise. Yeah, um, and I, I have an experience of sort of gathering community both online and in person. Um, so a church next course called Sacramentum ran during Lent. And so it was seven um, uh, virtual meetings. And so it was, it was meant to be a, a baptism or confirmation prep, but it really turned into like sort of an inquirers or a deepening of spirituality course. Um, and so, uh, there were online readings, questions and assignments, and then we had weekly zoom meetings with presentations from people across the Episcopal church. And then we split them up into small groups as well. So I'm just going to jump over to the, um, sort of, so we had a presentation experience, but then, um, so this was what church, church next uses for their coursework. Um, and I'm sure some of y'all have taken church next courses. Um, and then this, so this was Wendy Claire Berry uh, presenting here. Um, and so you could see that she was giving a presentation. She wasn't in the same room. Um, and then what I, what I found was that there were at least four groups that had um, this up on the projector and then they would actually have a conversation amongst themselves. So it was sort of this plug and play model um, for uh, formation during Lent. And so that's another way of approaching it is, um, is allowing your congregation to tap into something bigger that's happening. So I really, I, I just wanted to throw that out there as another, as another type of model. 
Sarah, may I make a comment here? Um, what I love about Church Next and, and certainly about what Steve has done um, um, is the idea that when you provide content by another means, mm -hmm. the participants are more free to focus on relationship and more free to engage content. Mm -hmm. So um, engage relationship. Um, so when, I, and I used to do this with my confirmation mentors as well. I would pair people very, very carefully, but I tried not to make the mentors be responsible for the content. Um, some could and some couldn't. Um, and, and, but what I wanted them to do was, was be in relationship with each other. Much like you would do with your Sunday school teachers. So I use that as an example of you wouldn't want, you know, you wouldn't say, oh, well, we're doing, we're doing epiphany and during epiphany, we're going to, you know, talk about parables for those four weeks. You know, you wouldn't say like, okay, just like go off and find stuff about parables. But you would say, um, you know, as the sort of coordination formation person, you know, these are the three stories that we'll be reading. These are, you know, the way that you can frame them, the background that you need, and some activities. So mm -hmm. you're sort of equipping them to, well, learn a little bit more about their own faith, but then also building those relationships with children, teenagers, whatever group you have. Exactly. And giving language, providing language. I mean, Godly Play says that we give children the language they need to articulate the relationship they already have with God, but um, I'm not sure that need ends with childhood. Yeah. Oh. And now I just want to ask, I wonder questions all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, do we have any other questions um, as we're, we're wrapping up here? I know one person did ask on Facebook, um, uh, Lene asked Steve what the, how large your church is, just so that she could get reference for what yeah. you're doing. The, the church, Grace, where I was doing those experiments, um, was uh, our average weekend worship attendance was about 550. Mm -hmm. Uh, my current church, our average attendance is about 1,200. You got some uh, mega, Lutheran mega churches out there. <laughs> and we're the little one in the neighborhood, so. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yeah. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to quickly check Facebook. Um, and Aaron, um, if, uh, if, I, if you can send me a message uh, with your email, I will follow up with some experience, um, with some experiencing resources about using um, disabilities and hybrid learning experiences. So go ahead and um, just either message me individually on Facebook, Sarah Stone Cipher, or um, send a message to the Center for the Ministry of Teaching so that way I can get you that information. All right. Um, so Day and Steve, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experiences and very different ways of approaching hybrid faith formation. And so that was one of the beautiful reasons why I chose both of you to join me um, today. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for the opportunity and thanks for all our participants for um, looking for a way to improve formation in whatever your context is. So we had um, over 90 people view in. Um, and so, uh, so we had a pretty robust chat going on. And I will be sending out all of these resources on Friday, um, both the, our, our lovely uh, video recording as well as um, the PowerPoint. And then I will also include a list, a list of selected resources as we've sort of gone back and forth, you know, talking about screencast matic Procreate. So that way I can include a link to that as well. Um, I'm going to shuffle through this. Um, another learning opportunity for you to build community online. We are doing an all online version of eFormation, much like we did last year. And so it is from 9.30 Eastern time until 5 p.m. Eastern time, including um, morning and closing worship, four workshops, and two affinity group opportunities. And so it will include mind brain education, curation and formation, um, you know, technology and the church and a workshop on communications. And the affinity groups will be wonderful. And so we'll be able to, um, to really have time to have a conversation about what you've been learning. So that's a really unique opportunity. 
Um, so that's sort of my next thing that I'll be able to bring the e-formation learning community. Um, and then coming up in the, uh, in the spring is something that Dave was actually a part of, the hybrid faith formation cohort, is that we will be asking um, formation volunteers or professionals or really awesome faith leaders to sort of take an intensive community look about what they're doing and then provide guidance along the way, specifically around hybrid faith formation um, and so uh, so that will be launching in spring of 2019 probably around February um, so that way we can all take a breath after Christmas um, so that we can think about these about these issues holistically and looking at our entire communities as we attempt to tackle this hybrid faith formation so I will be um, announcing that probably probably after general convention of the Episcopal Church, so probably after July, um, and we'll, we'll send a sign up link around that time as well. Um, but I just wanted to give everybody a shout out if that was, if that was something that was interesting. Um, we'll include the resources here, so no, don't worry, they will come to your email inbox. Um, and then just a quick uh, shout out to Day and Steve, and then to keep in touch with us as you have questions about, about sort of what you're attempting to do within your formation community. There were a lot of different questions coming from a lot of different places, so I know that we couldn't answer all of them, but I hope that we at least scratched the surface and gave you inspiration for what you're trying to do. And so thank you, as Day said, for really digging into this question and being willing to explore. Um, so with that, I am going to go ahead and um, ask Day and Steve to keep here, um, but we are going to uh, sign off um, and we look forward to our next opportunity to convene our information learning to community. Um, and again, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm the digital missioner at the Center for the Ministry of Teaching housed within Virginia Theological Seminary. So once again, thank you so much for being a part of this learning community.